This is 1.2 notes, maintaining life in homeostasis. The essential question is, how does necessary life functions and survival needs help in maintaining homeostasis, and what are the consequences of homeostatic imbalance? Necessary life functions are eight characteristics or properties that all living things must be able to do. They can't do one or two, they must be able to do all eight in order to be considered living. The first one is called maintaining boundaries. It means that you are allowed to let good things in like nutrients, oxygen, and then not let bad things in like uh, any kind of organism, microorganism that can hurt you, a viruses, bacteria that can cause illness. Classic organs that do that kind of job is the skin, which prevents a lot of uh, microorganism or things that could harm us to keep it out and then also protects us against water loss and things like that. All living things must be able to move. That could include change in body position like when we move our arms or walk or move our head. It could also mean the movement of stuff, materials inside our body like the blood traveling in our blood vessels, food moving, our, moving down our digestive tract, air moving in our respiratory tract. Third one is responsiveness. All living things must be able to respond to the changes in environment. It's like a, a plant that always grow towards the sun or grows against gravity. That's responsiveness. Or when there is a dis, uh, distinct drop in the temperature and you start shivering and you get goosebumps. Those are all considered responsiveness. Digestion is a property that all animals must be able to do in order to get energy. So some organisms, like plants, get energy through a different process, but animals and insects, and we are part of that, have to eat, take in food, and then be able to break it down into small pieces so that it can be absorbed into the blood so that it can be used. All living things must be able to metabolize. So metabolism is all of the chemical processes that occur in the body, including digestion, but also building of new cells and repairing of the body. All of the chemical things that are going on in the body is metabolism. Excretion is the process of removing waste, but it just excretion means that anything that is, is coming out of the body. Um, it could be uh, the examples that were given in class were sweating, uh, when you go to the restroom, uh, urinate or defecate, or it could be tears, uh, saliva, any kind of enzymes that are being released into the digestive tract that help in digestion. Anything that is coming out of the body is called excretion. The last two necessary life function is reproduction, which means that you must create a new individual organism. And growth means that you have to grow in size. So there are five survival needs that all living things must have in order to stay living, maintain life. Uh, these necessary life functions are things that living things must do. Survival's are needs are things that living things must have in order to survive. So the first thing is nutrients. So any kind of food that we reuse for energy is called nutrients. We also need oxygen because without the oxygen, we cannot release the energy from the nutrients. Remember that process was called cellular respiration. And then we need water because all of the chemical processes or metabolism that happen in the body has to happen in the water medium. So majority of our chemical reaction that occur in the body has to happen inside water. And this is the reason why we are 60 to 80 percent water. Not only do we need the water as a medium for metabolism to occur, we also need to maintain a stable body temperature. So for humans, that is 98.6 degrees, and mo majority of our chemical reactions will slow down or stop if it's even a degree higher or lower. The last one is atmospheric pressure. 
we must have a certain type of pressure that allows for our uh, respiratory system to work, allow for us to uh, get oxygen into our body and get rid of carbon dioxide. Pretty much the blood moving in our blood vessels is created by differences in pressure difference. This is why it is hard to breathe or you get really lightheaded or you could be, a de be deprived of oxygen when you are at high altitude because there is uh, less atmospheric pressure. Also is the same for if you go deep underwater, there has to be something that regulates the pressure because having too much atmospheric pressure could cause uh, us to take in too much or cause problems with our respiration and our blood pressure. Table 1.2 shows you the survival needs or the requirements for the organisms, the five factors and their characteristics and their specific uses that help the organism survive. All of the eight necessary life functions and the five survival needs, the whole purpose of that is to maintain homeostasis. Homeostasis is the ability of a body to maintain a stable internal condition. And when your body is not in homeostasis, it is called homeostatic imbalance. That could indicate that when you are sick, when you have disease, or just the process of aging can put you out of whack and get your body away from homeostasis. For example, when you go to the doctor's office, notice that what they do is they weigh your weight, they may take your temperature, they take your pressure, they measure your uh, respiration, your pulse. The reason why they check all those things is that when your body temperature is not at 98.6 degrees, if it's higher or lower, it can indicate that there is something wrong. Your body is not able to maintain a stable body temperature. So your body is not in homeostasis. If when they measure your blood pressure and it is not a 120 over 80 and it's high, it could indicate certain problems with your heart. So homeostasis means that your body, when you're healthy, it should maintain a stable internal com uh, condition and your body, all of your system, their job is to maintain all of the homeostasis in your body. The way your body maintains homeostasis is through homeostasis control mechanism. Uh, throughout your body, you have receptors which are little indicators that is sensing any kind of changes within that uh, homeostasis. So your homeostasis is thrown out of balance. When they detect that, let's say for, say for example, um, your blood pressure. Uh, there are pressure all over your blood vessels that are measuring the pressure to make sure that the correct amount of blood is traveling through those blood vessels because high pressure in certain blood vessels could cause it to burst. So when those receptors go off, then that information gets sent to the control center. The control center has to figure out what information is coming from the receptor then have an appropriate action. So if there is an indication that there is too much pressure in a blood vessel, that means there is too much blood going to a certain area, then the appropriate action would be to slow down the blood flow to that area. And that's what the control center would do. Once the control center has determined what the action must be, it will send out its information to the effector organ. So for example, of the, of the blood pressure, it will actually tell the heart to slow down the uh, heart rate to slow down the blood flow. So in this example, the heart will be the effector organ. You also have receptors in your blood vessels that measures the levels of hormones. So when there is not, there is, should be a correct level of hormones. So when your receptor detects that there is too low of a hormone, the control center gets that message that there is not enough levels of hormone in the blood. 
then the control center will send a message to the organ that is responsible for producing that particular hormone and tell it to start producing more hormone. So that organ that produces the hormone will be the effector organ. There are two types of methods that are used in the, in the homeostasis control mechanism, two types of mechanisms that are in fact, the most common one is the negative feedback mechanism, which means when there is too much, then you decrease it, or where there is not enough, then you increase it to a normal level. That's the negative feedback. The more uh, rare type of feed feedback would be the positive feedback, which is only happens in emergency situation or usually in a non-normal situation where when there is too much of something, you actually tell it to produce more. Um, the only example I could think of of a positive feedback would be when a mother is in labor and she's a, she is delivering a baby and the contraction occurs to squeeze out the baby and there's a lot of pressure in the uterus instead of telling to you know slow it down and slow down the contraction because it's too much it actually tells the uterus to contract more and more and more in order to squeeze the baby out here is a diagram showing you the process. So you have some type of a disruption in the homeostasis that will trigger the receptors. Then that receptor is going to send the information that um, there is a not enough levels or too much of something. Then that control center then will figure out what needs to be done and will send the information to the effector organ and their job is to carry out some type of action, a response that's going to bring the homeostasis or bring it back to its normal state. Here is another simpler diagram showing you the homeostasis control mechanism and the previous one and this one, they're both examples of the negative feedback. So you have a stimulus that there, there is a disruption in the inter, internal environment. There is a disruption in the homeostasis. That information is going to be detected by the receptor. The receptor will alarm the control center saying, hey, there is a disruption in the homeostasis. The control center will figure out what is being disrupted. Then they will send a command to the effector organ. An effector organ can be any organ muscle or a gland that's going to carry out the command of the control center and then will send out a response to correct whatever disruption that has occurred that messed up the homeostasis in the first place. Homework 1.2 is number one, give three examples of how the body maintains homeostasis in the body in everyday life.